who had more than 30 years practicing and researching holistic health. He's a founding board member of the Global Wellness Summit, founder of the Extreme Wellness Institute, and co-founder of Beth the World Foundation. He has published more than 100 peer-reviewed peer scientific papers and many books and technical texts on wellness and natural medicine. Uh, thank you for being here, Dr. Mark. Would you also like to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, well, thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, this is great to be able to talk to people across the world. Um, yeah, so I've had a 30-year career as an integrative medicine doctor. I spent more than half my career as a university professor studying wellness, and I've done lots of research and supervised PhD students in all different areas of wellness, from herbal medicine and nutrition to um, spa and um, hot springs and sauna and health retreats and acupuncture and detoxification and elite athletes and um, electromagnetic fields and health hazards in the home and uh, assessment of you know um, health hazards and um, clinical um, chemical uh, exposures, um, organic food research. So yeah, I've got a very broad, um, I guess, interest and um, all the things around wellness is my in my area and. Um, Recently, I've just set up um, a new company that does probiotics, that, that, which we can talk about, um, that makes um, yeah, f um, natural ferments that are infused with herbs. And um, um, I'm still doing clinical practice. I do online practice where I do um, I do some medical cannabis prescribing, but also just lifestyle and um, holistic health. And one of the first things I do with my patients is I tell them, I want to make sure you sleep well and that you digest well. Unless you sleep well and digest well, then whatever else I'm going to do is not going to help. And once you sleep well and digest well, your body will just fix itself anyway most of the time. So I'm really passionate about gut health and um, and brain health, but they're totally connected, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that. Yes, for sure we will. Um, so as an integrative medical doctor, university professor, author, poet, entrepreneur, <laughs> How did the study of nutrition and nutrition sciences and gut health found its way into your life? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I spent 38 years at university, which is a bit longer than most people. But in the normal medical degree, which was six years, we didn't really learn a lot about nutrition. I mean, we learned the Krebs cycle and, you know, some of the um, nutrients and things. Um, but it wasn't until I graduated and I'd been practicing as an integrative doctor and I was approached by a, a nutritionist naturopath pharmacist who said that she wanted to work with me to write a textbook on herbal medicine and nutrition and I said I'll, I'll write the textbook with you if you do a PhD with me so I supervised her PhD and she helped me write a textbook and this textbook that was in that year 2000 we started and the first textbook we wrote had 400 pages on herbs and supplements and the, then they went to the second edition, which had 800 pages, and the third edition had 1,200 pages. And now, this is the book up here. It's got the latest edition has two volumes at 1,600 pages. So I learned a lot about nutrition and herbs, actually from writing the textbook about it. And um, I guess I'm quite well known in Australia because that textbook now is the one of the founding textbooks for all the naturopaths and herbalists and integrative doctors in Australia. Um, so that was sort of the academic in introduction to nutrition. But I've always been a foodie. I mean, I love food and I love, you know, natural whole food. Um, I've done a lot of research with organic food. Um, about 10 years ago, we showed that um, one of my PhD students, Lisa Oates, and I did research where we showed if you have organic food, 80% organic food for one week, you reduce your pesticide load by 80%. Actually, by 90%, 80% diet, 90% reduction in, in organic, um, organic phosphate pesticides in your urine after one week. And it means you, you pee them out. So. You know, I, I was introduced through my mother, I guess, who made great food, and I've always been into um, healthy food. And then academically writing textbooks, and then since then I've done research into um, nutrients and herbs and um, organic food, etc. So yeah, I've had a, I guess, a broad introduction, and I'm still learning. Um, and most recently, it was actually during the the, um, the first lockdown we had here in Melbourne, so in 2020. Um, I have a friend of mine who has a kombucha company. And he makes this amazing living probiotic kombucha. And he's been telling me for years, our oh, kombucha fixes everything and any health condition kombucha will fix it. And I'm saying, yeah, show me the research. And um, you know, cause I'm, I'm very skeptical like that. And during the first lockdown, I had some time to actually investigate the research. And I, there's probably you know, a few hundred studies on kombucha, um, but none of them are on humans. They're all on animal studies or historical studies or on the different bacteria and the fermentation processes. Um, 
So, and, and but if you read about the, the animal studies, I mean, kombucha was called the elixir of life or the elixir of immortality. Um, and it started maybe, I think maybe you know, 10,000 years ago in Manchuria where they were growing, making tea and someone obviously made a, a pot of sweetened tea and left it there and it went, you know, fermented and it became fizzy and it became delicious and became tart and vinegary. And they realized when you drink that, it preserves the tea and it makes you feel fantastic. And um, the story of kombucha was it was taken from China by the Mongols, you know, by the Mongol Empire um, over to Europe. And then the fermentation practices were, were um, sort of maintained in Europe by, by what were called the witches. You know, the witches were making brews and they were fermenting herbs and making tonics and, and potions. And you know, some, they, some of them got burnt at the stake because they, had, you know, they could make things that help or, or, you know, make you die or make you or heal. Um, but, but a lot of the, those fermentation practices became part of cuisine because it helps preserve foods. And all the and the herbs you used to preserve foods all became you know, part of medicinal law. And then, um, more recently, you know, kombucha has become a like a soft drink um, sort of trend. But it, but it, it didn't have research behind it. And I actually organised for a, we got an Australian industry grant and we got quite a bit of money to do research. And we did two research projects. And one that we just published at the start of this year, where we got a lot of the kombuchas off the shelf and we got. The, the living brew from the Good Brew Kombucha, which is my friend's company. And we analyzed, we did metagenomics analysis, where we analyzed all the different um, organisms in it, and we looked at the physicochemical properties, so the pH and the different polyphenols and the different chemicals. And what we found was that a lot of the shelf, you know, the supermarket kombuchas are actually sterile, that there's no living bacteria in it because they pasteurize them to make them shelf stable. Because kombucha as a living product if if you make it and you bottle it and you don't refrigerate it, you can ferment in the bottle, then it explodes or it gets alcohol in it and, and you have to get recalled. So it's a very, as a living product, it's very um, fragile. Uh, and, you know, we, we thought long and hard, how do we make a shelf stable kombucha that we can trans, you know, transport without cold chain logistics? And then I wanted to use all my herbal knowledge from writing these books to say, how can we then infuse it with herbs? And we worked out if we, if we ferment it for six months and it goes all the way to vinegar, so there's no sugar or alcohol left, then we have um, all, all these microorganisms. And we found that the living kombucha from my friend's company, The Good Brew, has 200 probiotic strains. And that surprised us. Because in, in most of the literature, they say kombucha has maybe four to 10 strains. Of, you know, and mostly acetobacter, which makes acetic acid. And um, my friend's kombucha, which tastes amazing, has mostly gluconobacter, which makes gluconic acid, which has a sweet tart flavor, but it's not sugar. And it's actually really good for you. Oh. <laughs> um, amazing. So, yeah, so all of we, this so we made, about yeah, we, kombucha, we made, I want to talk about gut microbiome. Why is it important so what, what what does what is the effect to our health so talking about the gut microbiome in, in our health is the same way as talking about soil for your garden now the most important thing any farmer will know to have good produce you need good soil and good soil means microbial life well humans we carry the soil around we are just you know evolved from you know bacteria and, and plants and we carry soil around in us in our gut and it's like the villi that, that lie in our intestines or the surface area are like the roots going into the soil of our, of our, of our gut bacteria. And our gut bacteria um, produce a lot of short chain fatty acids, a lot of nutrients. Um, they produce a lot of neurotransmitters, dopamine and serotonin. So that, that, and they act as the barrier between the outside world and our inside world. So to have a healthy gut microbiome is like having healthy soil. And if you think about a healthy garden, you can have a garden that's um, like a, a jungle, you know, permaculture, where you, there's many different plants and lots of diversity, and it's very hard for weeds to get a hold because all the plants have their own little role and they've all, all, all got their own little niche. And maybe one of those plants, if you took them out and put them in a, you know, in a open field, it would become a weed. But in this garden with lots of different diversity, then we know it, it, it all balances. And it's the same with our gut. You know, you want to have a very diverse microbiome in your gut. And if you have an overgrowth of one type of bacteria, you get this dysbiosis. And 
it's not that there's good bacteria and bad bacteria. I mean, there are some that we know are really bad and some we know that are generally good, but it's generally the diversity and the complexity. And we're still learning. Um, there's a company here in Australia, Microba, that do microbiome testing. And they tell me for every six patients they analyze, they discover a brand new bacteria that's never been discovered before. So we're still really learning. And, and there's more microbes in our gut than stars in the known universe. You know, it sort of boggles the mind when you think about it. And, and there's more nerves in your gut that go to your brain than, than that go from your brain to your gut. So we, have a, we talk about our gut brain. And you know when you say you have good gut instincts, your, your gut is able to think, and, so, and I like to think of your brain as your rational, um, you know, logical sort of thought process, whereas your gut has a thinking process that's more intuitive and more organic, and you want to combine both. So our gut is not just important for our nutrition and, um, and our, you know, building your body. It's really important for mental health. Um, your gut bacteria often control your mood, what foods you crave. And, and some people say, yeah, look, you know, I'm, I don't like that food or I don't like this food, so I, I never have it. It's not that you don't like it. Your gut bacteria doesn't like it. And you can train your gut bacteria to change and like different foods. Um, so if you're craving sweet things, you can actually alter that and that alters your microbiome. But our microbiomes are totally unique. It's like a fingerprint. You're, you know, anyone's microbiome is totally different from the next person. And... Um, as you know, as an infant, it's so important. We, we know, for example, breast milk. Most of the nutrients in breast milk don't feed the baby. They feed the baby's microbiome. And then the microbiome feeds the baby. So it's like the breast milk is like fertilizer for the soil, and then the baby takes the, the nutrients from the soil and makes more baby and, and grows into a child. So it's, it, we, you know, we still don't understand the full extent. And we've just coined the term microbial magic because the interactions between all these different organisms, it's like magic. You know, there's, um, and often people think, oh, overgrowth of yeast, yeast is a bad thing. Well, there's some really good yeasts. And yeasts take sugars, for example, and turn them into alcohols, and, and bacteria take the alcohols and turn them into organic acids. And this processing is, um, you know, we talk about processed food as being not so good, we want whole foods. Well, we process our own food in our gut. That's what our microbiome does. And this, these processes have developed over 4 billion years. So when, when we do that, we're tapping into 4 billion years of evolution, of microbial evolution, that's actually supporting us. So these bacteria have evolved to actually be our friends. And it's a bit disturbing when we think that we're waging war on our microbiome and, and bacteria. We have antibiotics, we have chlorine in our drinking water, we have food that's sterilized and microwaved and you know processed and and um, we've, we've just been removed from having living foods in our diet and supporting our, our gut. And I think that's you know, potentially leading to so many chronic diseases which originate from gut dysbiosis from whether it's cancer or heart attack and stroke and, and a whole range of neurodevelopmental diseases and neurodegenerative diseases um, can actually be seen to stem from a gut dysbiosis. Hey, uh, I think it was a lot of information there. Something that I really want to tackle in is the gut brain axis, like you said. Mm -hmm. so I think it's really impressive how our gut has this power to influence other systems in our body. Uh, such as our immune system and also our brain and our mental and emotional connections. So can you explain a little bit about how this works and what we should aim as people that need to eat every day, at least three times a day? So how, how can we support that? Well, I, I actually question that eating three times a day. I think that's been a media sort of hype. Um, I, I really believe in feasting and fasting and only eating when you're actually hungry. And I think a lot of people eat because it's time to eat or it's social or it's comfort or, you know, I'm bored or there's so many reasons why we eat. But if you only eat when you're hungry, it means your body is prepared to digest that food. The bacteria are waiting. They're, you know, they're, they're hungry for nutrients. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, I think, misinformation that we've been given from the, the so-called nutrition industry. You know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. We have to eat three meals a day. Um, and now we're actually learning the benefits of intermittent fasting. And we fast anyway overnight. Everybody fasts every night. 
And I think it's really nice to break your fast when you're actually hungry. And you know when you're hungry because you start to imagine food and you start to think about food and it means that your salivary glands start to salivate and your digestive juices are ready. And also means you've cleared out the, the previous meal. So you're really ready to digest the food that comes in, which means you're actually getting more nutrients out of that food, which means you, you can actually eat less and get more nutrients. And so, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of um, misinformation about you know, what we should need to eat. And just like there's a lot of misinformation about bacteria are the enemy and germs. We have to get rid of germs. I mean, bacteria are our friends. Um, and that's not just in our gut. There's also a, a microbiome on our skin that's super important and you know, they're related. So, um, in, so in ter we're talking about the, in terms of the gut brain axis, you know, the vagus nerve is the nerve of the parasympathetic nervous system and it innovates the, whole, the gut. And as I say, there's more branches that go from the gut to the brain than from the brain to the gut. And the parasympathetic so, nervous system is the one for us to relax, rest and digest. Rest and digest, as opposed to you know, fight and flight. Yes. Um, because because when you're anxious and when you're, you're if you're running away from a tiger as you're fighting for your life in a battle you don't want to spend waste energy on digestion mind you you don't want to waste energy on healing or um you know immune immune function all your energy wants to be on the outside in your muscles in your eyes and, and to be responding it's when you're safe in your cave that you can relax you can eat you can digest And this is the, you know, the relaxation, the, the parasympathetic rest and digest system. And that's when your gut becomes active. So when, when you're anxious, um, you know, if, even if you eat, you're not going to digest properly because your, your nervous system isn't in a situation to really relax and digest. So it's much better rather than to eat on the run when you're stressed, it's much better to, to fast, wait till you're really hungry, relax, and then have a relaxed meal. And, you know, it's not that bad to, you know, overeat, but it's, you know, it's good to feast and then you can go into a food coma and then you can really rest and digest. Um, rather, you know, so there's, there's a lot of different, I mean, you need to work out what works for you and, you know, I wouldn't be feasting every day and it's, so it is nice to snack as well. But I think um, everyone has a unique microbiome and that microbiome will control when, when you want to eat, what you want to eat. And I think we need to have a relationship with our microbiome so we can train it to be healthier and to support our nervous system better. Amazing. Um, another system that the gut microbiome also influences and has a huge role is our immune system. Uh, so I would also love to hear about that. So how, how, is, how does this happen? So the, our immune system is our sort of vigilante system that, that protects us from the outside world. So it's a barrier between the inside world and the outside world. And you know, it's really important on our skin. As I say, there's a really important microbiome on our skin as well, um, or the bacteria on our skin and the oil secreted on your skin. You know, when you touch things, they protect us and they detect other microbes and pathogens in our environment. But our, that skin, that, that mucosa, um, the outside world has this tube that goes from our mouth all the way to our anus. So it, that tube, which is our gastrointestinal system, is really the outside world. That's where that soil is, where the microbiome is. And it's guarding what goes to our in, internal world. And there are payer patches, these, these immune um, active areas in our gut, where, where most of the immune system is actually concentrated in our gut. And that's that helps us um, distinguish self from not self. So a lot of autoimmune diseases can originate from the gut. Um, we talk about leaky gut syndrome, where allergens um, can cross the, the gut barrier and they come into our body and then they, they cause havoc and autoimmune, autoimmune conditions. So having a healthy microbiome, it's similar, as I say, similar to a garden having healthy soil. If their soil is healthy, even if some other seeds from some, you know, plants that you don't want or, you know, pest plants, they won't get a, a foot in because the, the soil is healthy and there's a lot of diversity of plants. So it protects um, your garden from being overrun. But if you've got a scorched garden, if you've, you know, got rid of all the plants or you've, you've had antibiotics in your gut um, and you've cleared out the good bacteria, then some bad bacteria can just overgrow really fast and take over. And You know, I remember in medical school, you know, when we learned about the appendix, they, they said, oh, look, we don't really know what it's for. It's a vestigial organ. But now they actually think your appendix is a repository for this gut bacteria in case you do have some 
episode of you know diarrhea or something that clears out your gut you can recolonize your gut from the, the little blind pouch which you which is your appendix so the, the immune um, role of our gut is still being understood as i said we, we we still are learning the different bacteria and we're learning how it functions um, but it, it's of absolute vital importance and that's why when what you eat can have such you know food intolerances and um allergies and um, as I say, autoimmune conditions can all be you know, really tweaked by how your gut responds. Amazing. So now let's talk a little bit about fermented foods. So as mm -hmm. you said, they are one of the key things that we should have in our diets in order to have a healthy gut microbiome, a healthy gut brain access, immune system, everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can talk about kombucha, but there are also many other foods that are there fermented. Are so many. Yes, can you talk a little bit about that? What are they? How are they made? And why sure. are they important? Well, if you, if you think about our ancestors, they didn't have refrigerators and, and food packaging facilities. So they would have had fermented foods with every single meal. Most of the foods they would have eaten that are fermented. And I think there's even talk in the Bible how I think Moses said, you know, he his longevity, was, he had sour milk. And in the Roman Roman legions would have, um, you know, f ferments and um it, for, you know, most cuisines, and, and I'm a big fan of Michael Pollan, and he, and he doesn't talk about diet, he talks about a cuisine. And the cuisine, most cuisines would have some sort of living ferment with every meal. So, and it's not much, maybe a tablespoon or two. So there's always a side of pickles or some kimchi or yogurt or some living food just as a condiment that's part of your meal. And th that's, that's happened forever. Since humans were humans, we've been eating ferments. And these ferments have evolved with us. So, so for example, with kombucha, we talk about a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast, where the bacteria and the yeast are in this um, really positive relationship that's evolved over you know, certainly millions of years, where the, the yeast take the sugar and make alcohol, and the bacteria take the alcohol and make organic acids. And this is a food processing plant that we have in our gut, but we can also externalize that. Um, but, if we're talking about preserving foods, it's super easy to make your own sauerkraut, to make your own kimchi, to make your own kombucha or kefir. And it's, it's not just easy, it, it's really cheap. It, it actually enhances the nutrients. So you get more bioavailability, um, you get more nutrients. And this is one of the, the, the research we did on, our, on the kombucha that we're making. Um, we did a physico-chemical analysis and we found that kombucha has two and a half times the polyphenols of green tea. And that was a really, we didn't expect that result because we start with green tea and sugar and the bacteria and yeast and we ferment it and suddenly we get two and a half times the polyphenols and, and polyphenols are like anti-aging chemicals. These are really powerful antioxidants that make green tea really um, healthy and apples and things like that. So when you look at a lot of foods, the polyphenol count will give an idea of the health benefits. But what, what we discovered was the bacteria and yeast must be making their own polyphenols from the tea and the sugar. So you can actually enhance the nutrient density of foods by fermentation process. And it's, it's not just um, you know, for your health, ferment, fermented foods are delicious, but you need to train your body um, to accept it. So in Chinese medicine, we talk about the five flavors. So there's sweet, salty, spicy, sour, and bitter. And most people in the modern world, I think they have a lot of sweet, salty, and spicy. They don't have much sour and bitter. Now, fermented foods are generally sour. That's why we call it sauerkraut. And you know, that, that, the vinegar you get you know, the, the, from the ferments, they make sour. And bitter um, is often from herbs. Although most people in the modern world get bitter from coffee and chocolate. That's where they get their bitter flavor. Uh, but it's really nice to balance those five flavors. And certainly the sour and the bitter flavors, so, and so from fermented foods, um, they enhance your taste buds, they stimulate your liver so you get better digestion, and they balance blood sugar afterwards. So, and I know in Europe, it's very common to have an aperitif or a digestive you know, with a meal before a meal. Which might, which might have bitters in it. And that then stimulates your taste buds. So you actually enjoy your food more because you get more flavor from your food, <clears throat> which makes you tend to eat slower and get more enjoyment from your food. It stimulates your digestive juices in your liver. So you get more digestion. So you get more, you're extracting more nutrients from that food. 
And then you, it stabilizes the blood sugar after the meal. So you don't get this drop in blood sugar and you, you feel like you have to have desserts and lots of sugar afterwards because you've got this, you know, hypoglycemic episode. So if you, when you do that, you tend to enjoy your food more, get more nutrition, tend to eat less and um, your um, digestion works better because you've got less bulk and it takes a lot of energy to digest food. And often people, when they eat three meals a day, just on the clock, they have to sort of evacuate the last meal to uh, allow for the next meal. And they haven't even finished di digesting the last meal. So your gut is actually working overtime, but you're actually not getting the benefits and the nutrients that you could from the food. So there's a lot in there in terms of um, you know, using fermented foods to prepare your um, body for accepting other foods and digestion, but you don't need much. As I say, when, when you have, if you look at most cuisines, whether it's China or Japan or um, India or, or Europe, you know, there's a couple of tablespoons of sauerkraut or some, some, some sort of living ferment that then aids with the digestion of the rest of your meal. And I think that's a really powerful practice that we've sort of lost. And a, a lot of modern people don't have living foods um, with every meal. And as I say, they have chlorine in their water, they have antibiotics, they have food that's been sterilized, and their guts are like this barren earth that it's really hard to, um, for good bacteria and all, all these other nutrients that the good bacteria create. So um, I, I see a lot of patients with anxiety, for example, and a lot of anxiety comes from your gut. And if you can stabilize people's digestion, their mood stabilizes, they feel calmer. And I think in the popular culture, they talk about being hangry, you know, when you're hungry and angry or, or you get anxious when you're, you know, you get butterflies in your stomach when you're anxious. So these are all um, ways that your gut talks to your brain and affects your mood. And if we can stabilize that and you stabilize that with all these techniques, but certainly fermented foods help with that, um, it just makes you calmer, happier, healthier, makes you lose weight, you enjoy your food more. It's just good on every level. And one of the, the other things about fermented foods I really love is when you make them, often you make too much. They're so productive. So when you, I mean, you get one cabbage and you make that into sauerkraut, you end up with jars and jars of sauerkraut. You want to give it away to your friends. And if you're making kombucha at home, you know, it just keeps on growing scoby. And what do you do with all the scoby? Well, you give it away to your friends. Mind you, the scoby that grows on the top, that, you know, the, the, the cellulose part of the kombucha is amazing to give to pets. And dogs who are anxious will respond really well to that because dogs have a very strong gut-brain axis. So if you've got extra scoby, you can give it to your dogs. I know people that um, cut up the scoby and give it to their chickens and infect, you know, and help with their ch chooks. So, um, but, but bacteria and yeast uh, and fermentation creates an abundance that then you want to share. And it becomes social. So you're sharing foods. Like I've got some of my PhD, my PhD student um, came over yesterday and gave me, you know, some homemade kimchi and I give her some kombucha and, and it's something you can exchange and it, it becomes literally a wellness culture. And that word culture has double meaning, you know, because, uh, you know, you start a ferment with a culture and these products that we create, the, the, like these vinegars behind me, it's actually a living culture. So you, you only need a teaspoon at a time, but if you... um. If you add sweet tea to that, you'll grow your own kombucha from it and you make kombucha forever um, just from a small amount of, of liquid because it's a living culture and it becomes part of the way we live. So in a, a cuisine is the food from a culture and each culture, I think Michael Pollan talks about it, that each culture often has a fermented food that other people don't like. So in, in Australia, we, we have Vegemite. You know, we're sort of, you know, it's like this black, sort of tarry food. And, you know, in Finland, they have fermented shark fin and, um, you know, in different areas, they have different cultured foods, which it's a sort of an acquired taste. So the, the, the social culture is actually related to the food cultures and the cultures actually we use um, in our diets. And when we have sort of multiculturalism, when we, you know, have different exchange of culture, whether you're having Japanese pickles or Indian pickles or kombucha or sauerkraut. This actually creates amazing diversity and, um, and enriches our lives. Amazing. I love this idea of this ripple effect. So you start and then you have people in your community, your friends, your family starting to get influenced by that. And then 
when you see everyone is already doing it and in love with it. So this is a really nice view. I have one question still regarding fermented foods. For some people, they're starting to dig into this world, starting to understand. Sometimes it, the concepts can be a little bit confusing. So prebiotics, mm -hmm. postbiotics, probiotics. So we have yeah. exactly. Um, and then sometimes I'm okay. Kombucha is a probiotic and what is a prebiotic what is what are the roles in our health so can you also explain a little bit about that sure and i guess the language has exploded and just with our knowledge is exploding so there's prebiotics is the food for the bacteria and often prebiotics are things like fiber um you know high fiber foods so fruits and vegetables and things with um insoluble fiber which we used to think about as being good for our bowel because they help with bowel motility but often these um fibrous foods Uh, feeding the gut bacteria, and that's called a prebiotic. A probiotic is something that's living that actually changes your gut flora. And and I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding there because just because it's a probiotic doesn't mean the probiotic you're having doesn't necessarily colonize your gut and stay in your gut. They're actually different organisms. And when we did our metagenomics study on the kombucha, we found 200 different strains of probiotic, and these are um, bacteria that can survive the acid of the stomach because the kombucha is acidic. But it's not that they all colonize our gut, but it's like putting um, mulch on your garden. You know, you're adding organic material to the garden, which helps the soil. And it's not like the mulch and the, the, the contents of that mulch change the soil, but the soil um, mixes in with that and enriches the soil. So probiotics, while they're alive, um, they're not necessarily um, your reseeding or recolonizing your gut with these bacteria and there's a, quite a lot of probiotics are grown in a laboratory and they're a single strain or maybe one or two strains um, and that's very different from a wild ferment so when we make kombucha or sourdough or, or sauerkraut usually that's called a wild ferment where you're not adding a specific you know, strain of bacteria although in the kombucha world we try and maximize gluconobacter because gluconobacter makes this gluconic acid, which is sort of tangy and sweet and, and good for you. Uh, but there's multiple strains that you get, and they're in the air. Um, there's a really interesting um, experiment we've been doing with um, Jun. So there's a, a, a drink called Jun, which is fermented honey. Um, and I think it was originated in Tibet. Um, and it's probably more ancient than kombucha because cane sugar wasn't that available 10,000 years ago, but honey was. So they would have had tea with honey. But honey is normally very antimicrobial. So it's hard for bacteria and yeast to, to digest honey. And I think they've found honey in the, you know, the Egyptian tombs that were still edible. But, but they've actually got, um, there are strains of uh, bacteria and yeast that can ferment honey. But these strains are much stronger than kombucha strains. So if you try and grow kombucha and jun in the same room, the, the bacteria and yeast go into the air and they float, the jun bacteria and yeast float over to the kombucha and they take over the kombucha because um, they're, they're, you know, they're so robust. So, yeah, so there's a lot of, um, I guess, complexity in the bacteria. And, and what we call a symbiotic is a combination of prebiotic and probiotic. Um, and generally, you know, a healthy diet would have that naturally because if you're having living foods and you're having good fiber in your food, then it's both prebiotic and probiotic. And I guess some of these terms, they become more technical for the food industry to sort of distinguish. But if we look at, if we, I'm really, I really love combining ancient wisdom with modern science. So you look what the ancients did, you know, they, they, they were making natural ferments, but with foods that have high fiber. So, you know, cabbage has a lot of fiber. And then when you ferment and you add some salt and, and you're actually just getting the, the bacteria and yeast that's in the cabbage leaves already. You don't have to add anything. Um, so that's you just that's a wild ferment. I mean, you can do wild um, fermented sourdough as well, although it does depend on the bacteria. If you're going to do it, go, go, it's good to go near a good sourdough bakery and just do it. The bacteria and yeast will be in the air or you get some sourdough culture from someone and they'll pass on that culture. And um, I've heard the stories, I, I, I've never, I've tried to look this up on the internet, but apparently in Russia, there were these women who were the, the holders of the culture and, and literally the culture that would make the sourdough or would make the kefir or whatever. And I was told that in Russia, there are um, statues for these women who are famous because they would you know, 
create that culture and then pass it down from generation to generation. And often, I think in Chinese medicine, they talk about that as well, how different um, medicines would get passed down from father to son and they'd be the family secrets. And often these were cultures, they were literally combinations of bacteria and yeast that had high value and they were kept as very precious. Um, whereas nowadays, you know, you know, we've got our, our kombucha that we say 200 strains, have them and grow it yourself. Um, because we give away the, the living culture with every you know, drop. So I think that there's a lot of complexity there with the language that we're using. As I say, the understanding is, is still really growing. Um, and, and this term microbial magic that we've coined sort of tries to summarise the fact that we don't fully understand this, but we know that it's good and we know that there's some there's some magic there that, that is beyond our comprehension right now because the complexity even in one microorganism and its metabolism is, is super complex. If you've got 200 microorganisms all working together, and then what we do with that with the kombucha that we make, the, 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 the tonics, is we soak herbs in it. And we get 10 different herbs, and because I wrote the text, I know a lot about herbs, and, and then we, we soak the herbs in it for a month. And the herbs we use are a combination of leaves, roots, flowers, fruits, and fungi. So that adds a whole nother level of complexity because there's medicinal mushrooms there, there's the, the root elements, which are sort of earthy flavors. Then you've got the fruity, floral, um, you know, high sort of note flavors. And when you can combine them, you get this incredible complexity that is um, just, you know, it's, it's way beyond what where you can analyze in terms of, um, you know, doing, you know, what are the chemical constituents and which one is the active ingredient and which is the excipient. It's all just combined together. And th that's also been a tradition. So when you make kombucha, often you'll make a base with tea and sugar and you have your, pri that's called the primary ferment. And then it becomes naturally fizzy because when the, um, when you get the fermentation to alcohol, it makes carbon dioxide, so it gets naturally bubbly. But then it'll, it'll slowly go towards vinegar. The more it ferments, the more vinegar you get. And it's up to you to work out by tasting it after maybe a week or so, you taste it until, oh, I like it a bit sweeter or I like it a bit more dry and a bit more vinegary. And at that point when you like it, when you get the flavour that, that you like, and your taste buds actually change as you do it, that's when you bottle it, put it in the fridge and you'll stop the fermentation. So, so it actually requires a bit of interaction with you and the food to, to decide when you when you want to you know, drink it and, and how, how much you want it to ferment. And often people think, oh, it fermented too much, it's gone to vinegar, I've wrecked it. Well, you haven't. This, I've seen kombucha vinegar that's been you know, sitting in the garage in someone's jar for 10 years. And then you add sweet tea to it and you revive it and it, and it starts growing again. So all you need to do is add more sweet tea and you can do it. But that's, that's the primary ferment. Then what you can do is you take that vinegar or the, the kombucha, um, depending on how you like it, you put that into another jar and you can then add whatever you like. You can add fruit, you can add herbs, you can add um, you know, vegetables if you want, it's um, whatever flavours you want. And, um, and we've just been experimenting and, and my, um, my business partner, Dino Callahan, he, he's a, a flavour master. And he, he was just thinking the other day, how do I come up with bubblegum flavour? And, and he worked out, okay, bubblegum, it's sort of like strawberries and banana and marshmallow. And so he, he got the base kombucha with its 200 strains and he had um, biodynamic strawberry powder and, ban and ban organic bananas and marshmallow root. And then he had, there's a, a, a gum tree in Australia called strawberry gum where the leaves and the twigs smell and taste like strawberry. And we had strawberry gum. So it's, it's a natural bush tucker. And we call that bush tucker bubble gum. But it, and it tastes like bubble gum. It tastes like hubba bubba bubble gum. But it's incredibly so. Kids love it. I mean, it's it's the best soft drink you can ever have. Um, but it's a totally unique flavour. But and you can experiment with flavours. If you like mango, put mango. If you like apple, put apple. You know, it, it's up to your imagination. And yeah, it's it's it allows your culinary art to come to the fore. And every place is unique. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's. There's so much benefit of uh, experimenting and doing this yourself and starting a primary ferment, working out how much vinegar you like or how much how sweet you like it, and then adding secondary ferments, putting berries in or fruits in or, 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 or herbs in, medicinal herbs, turmeric or ginger or lemongrass or passionflower, you know, whatever you want. And then 
if you know a bit about herbalism, you can actually then design those herbs to have specific effects. You know, do you want anti-inflammatory action? Put some turmeric and black pepper. If you want, uh, you know, um, uh, relaxation, you can put, you know, passion flower or valeria. You know, it, it's up to your imagination. So there's, there's a whole wonderful world out there. Um, and it also takes you away from buying soft drinks, which are super processed, high sugar or fake sugar, and do nothing for your gut and, and for your intestines. So yeah, to move away from sort of corporate soft drinks and have boutique kombuchas that you're making yourself or having tonics that you can just add. And, and the other thing about the tonics or kombucha vinegar, you can mix it with oil and make salad dressing. It's amazing on salads. You can put a little bit of um, the kombucha vinegar um, in water and that's called a switchel. And the, and the Roman army talked about how they, the Roman army used to have switchels and then um, the British Navy used to have it. And in, in New England, the, the haymakers punch, where, in the, you know, the cotton fields, where it was the original rehydration solution, which is just water flavored with vinegar. And they used to put a bit of molasses or something. And that's actually better for rehydration than just straight water. Because if you have straight water, you get really bloated. Whereas if it's got the sugar and the organic acids and stuff, you absorb it much slower and you get much more benefit from it. So there's, there's really is an ancient tradition of eating ferments and, and creating ferments, whether it's drinks or foods, uh, but it's open now for us to then use all the different herbs available to us, all the different fruits and veg, you know, things available to us, and then use modern science to then reinterpret that to, to make it healthy for us. For sure. Um, it's really interesting. I'm super thrilled to try now, <laughs> but I'm sure many people might think that it might be too complicated. I don't have time for that or I need too many tools. Can you say how can we make this really simple, how everyone can make it, how long does it take, which kind of tools it, it do I need? <laughs> if you can make a cup of tea, you can make kombucha. So basically you make a cup of tea and you can start with, it's good to have the same tea all the time. So if you like black tea, use black tea. We use oolong and green tea, a, a particular blend. So you, you make you know, hot water and you make the tea. You add sugar. So it's a sweet tea. So it's a little bit more sweet than maybe you'd have it normally. And then you need a SCOBY. So you need someone to give you um, a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast. Um, and that often they think the SCOBY is just a cellulose part, like the, the, the tea fungus on top. But in fact, the whole liquid is SCOBY. The bacteria needs to go throughout the whole liquid. Um, so you get some liquid, some liquid SCOBY. So you find someone else who's got kombucha and often if they're making kombucha, they'll have too much. Or the other thing is if you just go to the shop and buy a kombucha, you can tell if it's alive by you put it into a glass, leave it into a warm place and wait a week. And if it grows like a film on the top, you know it's alive. And then you can just add sweet tea and keep it growing. So you can just buy a SCOBY because if, if it's a really living kombucha, then you can actually amplify it and keep it growing. So you can either you get it from a friend or you buy it from the shop and you work out that it's alive. Then you add sweet tea to it and you leave. So all the kombucha needs, all the, the SCOBY needs to grow is air and warm temperature. And it likes the same temperature that we like. So 22 degrees centigrade is perfect. And, and that's what they said hotels, you know, to hotel rooms at for you know, human comfort. Well, that's the comfort for a kombucha. If it's colder, it'll just grow slower. If it's hotter, it'll grow faster. If it's over about 30 degrees, it starts to get too hot and you can kill it. If you add 45 degrees or something, you'll, you'll cook it. So when you have tea, you want the tea to cool down before you add the scoby. So basically you make a cup of sweet tea, and when you've got the SCOBY, however much you've got, let's say you've got 100 mil, you can add up to, you can add up to 800, but I wouldn't go over 500 mil of tea. And the, big, the mistake that most people make, if they're going to make a mistake, is they'll add too much tea to too little SCOBY. And the key is you want to keep it acidic. And keeping it acidic is the key to making it safe. Because once it's below 4.5 pH, pathogens won't grow. And we know vinegar is a preservative. So as long as you keep it acidic and, and vinegary, it, pathogens won't go and it's going to be safe. And, and often you'll get this um, white film on the top, this white rubbery film, that, that's the scoby. If you get mold on that, like blue or green mold means that something's gone wrong. But if it's you know, brown, often it turns brown because of the tannins in the tea, that's fine. Or white is totally fine. So, so really, you're just making a cup of tea, adding to the scoby, 
five times whatever SCOBY level you've got to be safe, and then waiting until it's vinegary, and then you can add another five times. And then wait till it's vinegary, add another five times. And we did a calculation. If you do that 32 times, all the water on planet Earth will be SCOBY, will be kombucha because of exponential growth. You know, you know, you know there's a famous um, uh, a fable of a, a, a chessboard and um, one of the, the chess master says, you know, the, the, I think the sultan says, I'm going to give you a gift. He says, you know, you can have anything you want. He says, okay, for each square on the chessboard, I want to double the amount of rice. So one rice, one grain of rice for one, one um, square, two grains for the next one, four, eight. And by the time you get to 64, you've, all the rice in the whole world is not enough. That's the nature of exponential growth. And that's what you're tapping into when you're growing, you know, ferments, this exponential growth of bacteria. So, so you make a cup of tea, you add it to, to your SCOBY, leave it into a nice warm place with fresh air. And it's nice to put a cloth over the top so you don't get the vinegar flies coming in and bees or something to come into, you know, for the sugar. And then you just you know, take, maybe take a ladle or if you've got a tap. Often I, I, you know, I, I use fermenters that have a tap on the bottom. Often they get, they get clogged up. So you just get a little you know, um, spoon and you taste it. And when, when you say, wow, that's delicious, it's fizzy and delicious, that's when you put it in the bottle and put it in the fridge. It's that easy. And then if you want to do a secondary ferment, that's when you, you can put in your fruits or, or anything else you want. So if you can make a cup of tea, you can make a um, kombucha. <laughs> and the same with sauerkraut. If you can cut up a, a cabbage and add some salt and you just massage it, massage it, you know, that's how you make sour. And then you can put whatever herbs you want. You know, I often use turmeric or black pepper and, you know, whatever herbs you want. You can add, you know, fennel seeds or caraway seeds or whatever you want. But, you know, all you're doing is cutting up cabbage. You're using the bacteria in the cabbage already, adding salt and massaging it. And the, the salt makes it, it sort of weep or the, the liquid comes out. And you just want to make sure it's covered with liquid. And as long as it's covered with liquid, the, you know, and it becomes acidic, the, the mold won't get there. And, you know, that preserves for a very long time, but it makes it delicious. And it's so inexpensive. I, I, I know there's a lot of trendy, um, at least in Australia, there's a lot of trendy, uh, you know, sauerkrauts and ferments you can buy. And, and they're really expensive. But to make it, it's super cheap and super fun. And you, and as a gift, it's it's really, you feel very proud when you're giving someone a gift that you've made yourself. And then if you, want, if you like kimchi, you know, there's lots of recipes on the internet. For, you know, you put some chili in it or, you know, you flavor it. So it's it's super easy. And I really encourage people to experiment with this themselves. It's really hard to go wrong. Um, you can, if, you know, it starts looking blue or green and fluffy, then maybe <laughs> you, you can start again. And, and it's really nice to give the SCOBY away. And it's the gift that keeps on giving. And that way, if you give it away, if for some reason your SCOBY dies, you can, the person you gave it away to you say, can I have some of my SCOBY back? So you give it, it's the gift that keeps on giving because you give it away, but you're actually richer for the giving of it. Yeah. It's not, yeah. you're not getting anything less and, and you're, you're making a new relationship and you're banking your SCOBY out in your community that you can get it back. So it's just a wonderful thing to, you know, we talk about creating a culture of wellness that will infect the world with good health. That our brand called Extremely Alive, that's our, that's our logo, our slogan. So we, you can literally infect yourself with good health by tapping into fermented foods. That's really nice. And I think food since forever in every different culture has this power of bringing people together. Uh, even if it's just sitting at a table to eat, it's already nurturing our social health. And uh, it's really nice to also have this approach to fermented foods and how this it can become a community thing. So it's really interesting. I have one final question for us to wrap up. So thank you so much for everything that you shared, all your expertise. I learned a lot. I'm also mm -hmm. from the nutrition science field and it was amazing this last 50 minutes. So my last question would be for someone who is just starting, so never heard about fermented foods before, just listening and watched our webinar, how to start? What would be the next step or one advice that you would give to this person? Start, start tasting fermented foods. No, I mean, you probably have them because it's hard to go to any restaurant or any original cuisine and not have some sort of ferment. So once you, it's like, you know, if you don't, you, when you buy a green car, suddenly you're seeing green cars everywhere. If you start making fermented foods, suddenly you'll see fermented foods everywhere. But start to taste them and educate your taste buds. 
So, you know, Japanese pickles are fermented. They're very different from Indian pickles. It's very different from kimchi. It's very different from sauerkraut. But they're the same sort of um, theme. Um, go, and, go and buy some kombucha and compare that to, um, uh, you know, a soft drink. And, and actually experiment. See if your kombucha is actually alive. Put it in a glass, leave it there for a week and see if it grows a scoby on top and see how it changes. So you want to train your taste buds. And by training your taste buds, you're also training your microbiome and enhancing your microbiome. And what you'll realize then is you become calmer. You know, it balances blood sugar after a meal and you don't get this highs and lows. So your, your mood becomes calm. You start enjoying your food more. You start eating less. And um, you're basically expanding your culinary horizons. And it's it's a, it needs to be joyous. So if it, it feels like hard work, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Mark. I hope we can do this again soon because it was really nice. And I think there are many other topics that we could be covering here for hours and hours. Uh, I'm sure I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone watching also learned a lot. Uh, and that's it. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's been my pleasure. Thanks so much.